All right, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us for this uh, exciting webinar with Edgar and Peter Schein. We're gonna take a walk through history and some of their uh, most recent books, but I don't want to uh, take too much time with the setup. So I'm gonna turn it <laughs> over to Edgar Schein and he's gonna start sharing a little bit of his history that led to this series of books we'll talk through in a moment. So take it away, Ed. Thank you very much. It, it is sometimes puzzling to people how over my 60 plus 70 or so years career wandered around with all these different concepts. So I just want to tell you, I started out as a very serious social psychologist who was going to just have an academic career. But then my mentor, and some of you know this name, Douglas McGregor, uh, seduced me into going away from an academic career into a business school and uh, applying the ideas of social psychology to management. So that was an, an interesting segue that forced me to, to rethink how to think about things like leadership. And of course, you get involved in consulting and you get to know organizations through their managers and leaders. And lo and behold, you discover that equally effective organizations can be totally different in how they operate. So I was working in New England with DEC, uh, DEC uh, uh, Computer uh, Founding Company and Sibagagi, a chemical company in Basel. And that juxtaposition forced me into really thinking seriously about culture. So now I'm trying to compare organizations. And of course, that leads immediately to the recognition that it's all about the relationships that people form. Leadership is a relationship. Culture formation is a group learning together how to develop norms and, and ways of doing things. And then you think about, well, what is a relationship anyway? Because everybody agrees that relationships are important. But then we realize that we don't really know much about relationships. And about that time, I'm now retired, uh, trying to lead a peaceful uh, life in, uh, in Palo Alto, writing my autobiography. And about five years ago, in wanders <clears throat> Peter and says, hey, Dad, <clears throat> why don't we write a book together? You know, we have a lot of common interests. And so the focus on relationships and on humble inquiry and how it all begins to tie together really was the result of this very wonderful and fortunate uh, new career that I got launched into in my partnership with Peter. And so I'm going to turn it over to him to tell a little bit about his side of that. Yeah, thanks, Ed. Um, that was in about the, at the end of 2015, um, after about 30 years in Silicon Valley for me, where I had done a bunch of technology related things, and marketing and business development. <laughs> But um, I also spent a lot of time in corporate development at, at, at Sun Microsystems, a big, you know, big company that's now part of Oracle. And um, I realized in that process that what fascinated me most was how uh, uh, cultures are woven together in M&A. That we, you know, a technology company like Sun tended to sort of define their M&A targets around technology and intellectual property. But usually what uh, ultimately determined the success or failure of those acquisitions or those mergers was the, um, the meshing of technical culture and most importantly, the meshing of social culture. And um, so, uh, you know, that's when I sort of realized that's really was, was the core of my interest going back to my, you know, social anthropology days in undergrad at Stanford. And, um, you know, so so there's always what you do and what you're interested in. 
what Ed and I got to do in 2015, 2016, and, and since then is really focus on what we're interested in. And um, I will say that part of the, the uh, initial phase of, of our work together was um, some great discussions with human synergistics. And, and I actually went through the initial certification in the uh, uh, OCI OEI process. So um, uh, that, that was a good immersion for me. And um, it, it motivated some of the things that we have since written about. So that's a little on me and, and Tim, well, where do you wanna go? Well, thanks for that sharing. It, it's been an interesting few years bringing together the worlds of qualitative and quantitative culture assessment. And I think we've learned a lot from each other. But uh, this session's about your recent string of books, uh, many books, and uh, it's amazing, Ed, how productive you are. And uh, we're gonna start with Humble Inquiry, your recently released uh, second edition, and then we're gonna walk through three of your other books. But I'm gonna be go just the gratuitous uh, spokesmodel here. <laughs> You're doing a great job. <laughs> So let's kick it off with the uh, purpose of Humble Inquiry and why you wrote a second edition. Well, let me tie it back to what I was linking that uh, originally the book I wrote called Helping was sort of the, the real yeah, impetus. <laughs> and in that book, the last chapter is actually called Humble Inquiry in order to differentiate Humble Inquiry from other kinds of inquiry. And at that time, the publisher said, you know, that's a great title. You've got to write a book by that title. And I said, no, thank you, and kept saying no, thank you, until a, a year or so later, I had the experience of looking at a nice bunch of mushrooms that are growing outside this place where I live. And a little old lady with her little old dog walked up to me and pointed a big bony finger in my face and said, you know, those are poisonous, you know. Well, that offended me. And I looked up and said, yes, I know. Leave me alone. <laughs> but she didn't stop. She pointed the finger at me again and said, they can kill you, you know. Well, that I knew was totally incorrect. These might have given you indigestion, but these were not the killer mushrooms. So I got even more offended, and it suddenly clicked in my head that a lot of time I was spending, people were telling me stuff. A lot of it was wrong. And so I suddenly woke up that there is a bigger cultural problem here that we are actually living in a culture in which telling is the hero, knowing stuff, and so on. So I wrote a, a kind of an argument against telling, and that was the first edition. And as Peter will elaborate, it has turned out that the reasons for humble inquiry now are not just to point out that it's a better way to build a relationship, but that there are more critical issues these days around the whole problems of inquiry. Really? Yeah, I'll, I'll just add that the sort of, you know, in a, a lot of work situations, we have to sort of be careful to, to um, pay attention both to the content of what we're doing and the context of what we're doing. And we were writing the second edition of Humble Inquiry at a time where the context in the US is that there are essentially two fact universes, right? We don't all agree on the same facts. Um, it was at the beginning of the Trump administration that we were introduced to the term alternative facts. And everybody kind of laughed about it at the time but the reality is we live in that world. We live in a world that based on our media and our, our you know, broadcast media and our social media, we live in different fact bubbles. And 
what motivated a lot of the, the refinements we made to Humble Inquiry was to, 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 to pose that challenge. How are you gonna understand that other fact universe? Because in order to, you, re you really need to get to that, to, the, to that shared context to find the things that you can ev that everybody can agree on in order to make good decisions. And you know, work is about decisions. Your your career is a function of the decisions that you've made. So the a lot of the emphasis in the humble leadership series is on how do you get to more shared knowledge or more shared understanding. And it's through inquiry um of different kinds and 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 with a with a, a deep sort of motivation of caring and curiosity that you can get to a broader understanding of the context um, and not remain just focused on the content because we're we're you know humans are complicated and we're 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 very good at assimilating a lot of information um, but we have to be motivated to share it in order to make better decisions so that's what Humble Inquiry is sort of ultimately about. So what's it look like in organizations where managers and leaders might uh, be very concerned about the task and getting things done? You know, what, what should Humble Inquiry look like in organization and between individuals? Well, I think the, to, go, to go back to the original definition, Humble inquiry is the gentle art of, of asking about something to which you don't already know the answer. So the most important way of identifying what we mean by humble inquiry is that the leader, the manager, the person in charge, the convener, start with the recognition that he or she does not know everything from the beginning they may have a thought about where we're trying to go. But what we saw, particularly in writing the Humble Leadership book, is that there were very big, powerful, arrogant leaders who started their successful careers. Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore, uh, Gary Kaplan, the head of Virginia Mason Hospitals, they started by inquiring of how should we go about achieving our ends. Lee Kuan Yew knew where he was headed, but he needed his associates. He needed to build an economic development board. And he empowered all these people to get to work and do stuff. And even when it came to simple things when i interviewed lee kuan yu and asked him how did you develop all your policies in human resource type stuff in singapore he said well i got together with my people and we looked at how various companies were doing it and we saw that the shell system was really a good system so together we just decided to introduce the shell system into the singapore government so this is a big boss inquiring and then making decisions when he or she has enough information. That's one way it looks. The, and the other thing that maybe Tim, I'll just take this, this uh, point that um, humility, which you know we've written this series, the Humble Leadership Series, Humility has a specific definition for us that, that I think it's important to, to, to clarify. Um, we're not suggesting that every, everybody needs to learn how to be humble in a Christian or Buddhist or some sort of philosophical sense. Um, and in fact, many of the examples um, in the Humble Leadership book, you wouldn't think of those leaders as humble in that sense, but you would, except that they saw the, the situation that they were in and they could face every day embracing the fact that there was a lot that they didn't know and that they would, they would gain by inquiring of other people and you know, revealing but also um, 
opening people up to share what they knew in order to sort of build a, a, a bigger set of insights and facts with which to make decisions. So humility we define as here and now humility, that at that moment, at the beginning of every day or at the beginning of every meeting, you go in assuming the group knows more than I do. I may be the boss, but there's information out there that, that if we share, we're gonna make better decisions. So that's what the humble part of humble leadership means. And, the, and our definition of leadership keys <laughs> off the idea that um, it's doing something new and better and it happens anywhere in an organization. So, you know, it, it, while there's a lot of the, uh, you know, the, the, the way people interact with each other, may be driven generally from the top down or from the founder through the 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 growth of the organization the idea of leadership of doing something new and better that really can happen anywhere in an organization and we see lots of examples of that um, so uh, that that's you know our, our sense of how this scales through an organization is that people embrace that idea that the group knows more than they do and their their biggest goal as either c-level leaders or middle management is to um, broaden their scope by by gathering the information that's that's available in the group and not having it be um, a situation where people withhold information because there's some perceived advantage in withholding information to ultimately use against people that you're competing with in an organization. There, we've got a long history of doing that and we're not suggesting that's gonna go away, but we do think for companies that are facing, you know, the, the volatility, the uncertainty, the complexity and the ambiguity um, that most companies these days are facing, particularly coming out of a pandemic, um, we we want th their people to think about how how are you going to share context rather than withholding information and ultimately competing uh, with people with your peers and um, maybe even with your managers by by you know viewing that information as a weapon not a tool that needs to be shared. Great. Th thanks, Peter. And uh, Ed, you kicked it off saying it was all about relationships. And I, I know you share a structure of levels of relationships, actually, in all the books we're going to talk about. So, um, Ed, do you want to talk about those yeah. levels in that framework? The I, I got quite uh, irritated with how every, we all agreed that leadership was a relationship, that effective organizations had good relationships, but nobody defined even what a relationship is, and nobody noticed that in society we have all kinds of relationships, and they vary hugely in what you might think of as the depth of the relationship. So I pulled out of my sociological knowledge what what I now want to call a ladder of relationships, which is there are at least four very easily identifiable levels that society pretty much defines, where the the lowest level, uh, which we call minus one because it's almost a negative relationship, is domination, where someone has more power than you have and uses it to tell you what to do and you don't have any choice. That can be the prisoner, that can be the POW, that can also be the immigrant in the sweatshop who is told by his boss, you do this or I report you uh, to immigration. So uh, level minus one then evolves in most societies uh, we get out of feudalism and domination and develop the machine industrial age. And there we develop what society quite comfortably calls the transactional relationship, level one, where we have the buyer uh, and the customer and the doctor and the patient 
the manager and the direct report. And when you look at how those relationships work, they are based on learning as you become an adult in the society, what your proper role is in each of these situations. Are you the customer or the uh, seller? Are you the doctor or the patient? And the role specifies, you know, what you should be as a person. And you're only supposed to be what the role requires. So in those situations, you always find this concept of professional distance. And it's professional distance that creates the opportunity and often the incentive for the subordinate to withhold or lie or spin in the safety arena. We have all kinds of evidence that subordinates told bosses uh, or rather didn't tell bosses about something that had they told an accident might have been prevented and so on. So the industrial age has worked very effectively on this, but we found that with modern uh, complexity and organizations no longer being machines, but rather fluid open systems, that the professional relationship, distant transactional relationship no longer works. We now need level two more personalized relationships where the parties, even the doctor and the patient, have to, to some degree, collapse professional distance and get to know each other better. It's not always symmetrical. The doctor may get to know the patient better than the patient gets to know the doctor. But we found that it's in medicine particularly where we see more nurses and doctors beginning to talk about to make health really work, we do have to get to know our patients better. You can't just pick up the chart and treat them in an impersonal way. And then the next level, of course, is intimacy, friendship, and so on, which may occur in some organizations because the task is, is so dangerous and life-threatening that the people collaborating on that task really get to know each other on a very high trust openness level uh, that enables them to do these very risky things like SEALs doing an operation. So you have these four levels, minus one, transactional one, personalized level two, and intimate level three, and we are arguing pretty much that in today's organizations, the constructive thing is to try to reach as much as possible the level two personalized relationship in order to maximize the openness and trust that is needed for the communication to make better decisions and therefore more effective organizations. It's a pragmatic argument. It's not be nice. It has nothing to do with being nice. It has everything to do with collapse the professional relationship, open the door to telling each other what's really going on so that that here and now humility pays off by learning more and therefore knowing more and therefore making better decisions. So Peter, uh... Um, towards the end of Humble Inquiry, you talk about Humble Inquiry being an attitude and an art when it comes to building relationships. Can you talk a little bit about each of those perspectives? Yeah, sure. I mean, maybe I'll start with, um, we, we sort of have a little mnemonic um, that uh, I'll try to reconstruct. This actually isn't in the book, but we were uh, found that we we needed a little bit more to explain the the attitude, and um, the, the the there's sort of three parts of the mnemonic, and the first one is motivation, where um, you sort of embrace the idea that you really do care what 
the other person, you know, thinks and what's going on with the other person. And, and that's, you know, that's a sort of critical threshold. If you really don't care, then, then none of this may be relevant. You may not really feel like a level two relationship with that colleague is important if you really don't care. But assuming you do, because that's probably more constructive um, for both of you. Um, but you also, um, beyond that, there, there needs to be some level of curiosity, right? Um, that, you know, that's part of the distinction between arrogance and humility is that at some level, you are curious about what's going on with the other person um, because it matters. It matters in your work day and it matters in your ability to, to be resilient and flexible, right, is, is having some degree of curiosity what's going on with them. So that's the motivation. Then the, the next part is that um, the process of inquiring, of drawing people out, is an intervention and you have to sort of recognize it as that. Um, Ed has said famously over 50 years, everything is an intervention. And that, that sounds sort of like a, you know, no offense, Ed, but sort of a truism. But the point in saying that is that we recognize that we are intervening in other people's process. We are intervening in other people's work lives and we should be mindful and, and, and intentional about it. Um, but it, it also, we, we recognize, and this is sort of the crux of humble inquiry, is that we're intervening by asking, not telling, right? And, um, and so it, it's, and, and the other thing is, and this is a tricky one because um, we talk about it, but it's, it's, it's in, in maybe this is sort of where it gets into an art, is that idea of deep listening that we, we can, you know, we can consciously, you know, focus on really listening to people. But I think, you know, we know this, you know, from, you know, say oh, when Oprah Winfrey interviews um, somebody, she's very good at really connecting and really um, sort of, she's got a real deep art of, of deep mm -hmm. listening. So it's, you know, again, that's kind of alchemy. We, we don't suggest everybody needs to have that, but that's, that's part of the, um, needs to be recognized as part of the intervention. And then the last piece is contribution because it's not, it, it's a two-way street, right? You you're really are trying to develop a connection so that next time you're gonna share information, right? You're not gonna withhold information. And, you know, the key to that contribution is that there's two things. One, you have to recognize that that in order to make this a two way street, you're going to have to reveal a little bit about where you're at. And again, that's delicate because it can't come across as sort of stealing, you know, stealing the mic or or jumping onto the other side of the net as a metaphor that's often used. It has to be this reciprocation. Um, not, you know, not a, a, a sort of a flipping the relationship. You want it to be a reciprocal relationship. And, um, and the last thing is, and, and this is where, where we get into the, um, you know, often talked about critically important ideas of vulnerability and empathy. Because if you, if you can't demonstrate that vulnerability, I am sorry, that empathy, which you often, <laughs> you know, communicate through representing some of your own vulnerability, um, then, then, the, then the depth of that connection sort of is limited. Um, so the, the, it's that motivation, intervention, contribution is how we try to describe the, the, um, the overall attitude of humble inquiry. And that happens to spell Mike. And so our goofy little, <laughs> mnemonic here is it it's it's the idea of sharing the mic you have to be ready to share the mic um <clears throat> so it's long-winded but hopefully that helps sort of uh put a little meat on the bones of what we're talking about with humble inquiry great well, i'd let's... like to add another thought to that as well uh, around the listening and responding because one of the things that 
that I've experienced often and had to learn how to deal with it is I'll pick up the phone and there's a potential client on the other end who who said, uh, uh, Professor Shine, I understand you know about organizational culture. Uh, I, I'd like you to recommend a survey for me because I think I, I want to learn more about my culture. Now, at that moment, I have a choice between directly answering that question or what I've learned to do is not to take the surface stuff necessarily as what's important. So I might say in response, why do you think you need a survey? Or even more deeply, I might say, what is it that's worrying you that led you to think you need to look at your color, uh, your culture? And I find without knowing the answers to those questions, I don't know whether it would actually be constructive to just say, well, you can call human synergistics. But if they got a good person at human synergistics, he would be asking or she would be asking exactly the same questions. Why do you want a survey? What do you think a survey will do for you? So we, ha we have to get past uh, just taking whatever people tell us as the answer to our first inquiry or what they lead with and really look at what's going on, engage our own humble inquiry. And the person says, well, actually, I'm fairly familiar with... Uh, with surveying, and I've got these 20, 20 units in my company that I really need some instrument to compare uh, how they're doing. And I think uh, the cultural issue is very central. And you might very well then say, in that context, yes, a survey comparing those 20 companies might indeed be the best next intervention. But it would be based on having learned from that person what and why they are trying to do it rather than a knee-jerk reaction that, sure, I can recommend something uh, without thinking about why I'm doing it or what I'm doing. Tim, so, I'd like to add something too that, um, that I've learned a lot over the last few years with Ed about this this term that's really resonated for a lot of people when we talk about it, which is the idea of content seduction. That it's it's very easy in those initial discussions to get sort of focused on um, much more of the what when really the issues are on the the how, right? You, we and and so. Um, and and I, I feel like for me, this is partly because of all the years I've spent in, in Silicon Valley, which are all about inventing brand new things. And there's the focus is the what, right? And um, because it, it, you know, it's just that it, it's, it's, it's pure invention. You are going to, you are going to get seduced by that stuff. But now, you know, Silicon Valley are, are, you know, there are lots of startups, but there's also a lot of very big established mature companies that have tons of issues with the how. And um, so if we're going to help, we have to, to realize that getting seduced by that content um, ultimately sort of gets in the way. It's one of those things to, to, you know, for me anyway, to keep reminding myself, don't get seduced by the content, remember to stay focused on the context. Well, you dive into content seduction, I think, in a couple of your books, and maybe this is a good bridge to humble consulting, where you talk about the importance of being a helper versus an expert, maybe making process suggestions or other things, and, and how your roles might need to, to change. Uh, Ed, can you share a little bit about why you yeah. wrote 
humble consulting and, and what that's really getting at? Well, I think the <clears throat> the best way to illustrate yeah. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> this is to go way back to when I first learned how to be a consultant because uh, I was working with a group of young engineers in Digital Equipment Corporation that uh, had to decide on the what future products uh, they were going to invest their energy in, and they wanted me to sit in with them and help. And they had just a horrible process. They they interrupted each other. They were eager and you know just all over the place. And I would tell them, you know, interrupting uh, interferes with communication and so on. And the, and they'd kind of listen and say, "Yeah, you're right. You're right. We're you. Thank you. Very helpful." And then continue to do it. And I watched this for hour after hour. And finally, I realized that they needed to do it this way. That's the only way they knew how to interact. So quite intuitively, I discovered the how. I went up to the flip chart, which they had in the room, and person A started down a path of an idea, and I immediately started to write it down. And of course he was interrupted. But at that moment, I what came out of my mouth was, uh, Joe, could you tell me the rest of that idea? And magically, the group shut up and waited until I wrote the rest of it down. And the next person who got interrupted, I started to write it down. And the group and I sort of discovered together that my expertise, that people shouldn't interrupt each other, which was expertise, and I was advising them, was useless. But showing them how to finish a thought which fitted their agenda, they needed these thoughts. That took, and at the end of that meeting, they said, Ed, that was really helpful. They quickly learned to do that for themselves. And so the, the whole climate in the group changed. And I realized what I had done was intervene in their process rather than in their content. I didn't know anything about anything that they were talking about, but I knew that they needed to finish a thought. And I gave them a vehicle for that. And then I realized that's what most of my work was at that level, not to tell people what to do but show them a way of figuring out what they needed to do better, helping them figure out even at the content level. I might say, well, I've heard you compare option A, B, and C. Um, would you like to take a poll to see how you each feel about that? So again, I'm not telling them A is the best, but I'm helping them find a process by which they can decide which is the best. So process consultation uh, led to this way of working and the humble consultation was written because a lot of people accused me of creating a very slow process. All this, you know, I did slow the group down by going to the flip chart. And the world was moving more rapidly. So I began to look at how could this actually happen more rapidly by jumping in faster. So the, the group uh, starts down an agenda that I know is going to take forever. And I could ask all sorts of questions. But I jump in with, wait a minute, where did this agenda come from? And somebody said, well, it's the secretary who takes down uh, our requests. And then they say, well, wait a minute. Uh, how does she do that? Well, let's find out. 
So they bring the secretary in, and she, it turns out, takes the items in the order in which they are called into her. And then they wake up and say, well, that doesn't make any sense because the items are of different importance. So right then and there, within 10 minutes, we have reshaped the whole way in which this group worked <clears throat> by the intervention of how did this agenda come about? Why do you want, why do you want this survey? Uh, what is it that's worrying you? Those questions are actually speed up questions to get to the real problem quicker because the world now requires that speed. So as a consultant today, I still am a process consultant, but I jump in much more rapidly to try to get at what's really worrying you that we should be talking about. Those are great examples and uh, really focused on, on how to help groups. In humble leadership, you, you talk about actually going from a, a level one to a level two culture. So, I mean, how do you make the bridge from just helping one group or uh, doing some of the things you talked about, Ed, to actually having a level two culture where level two relationships are the norm? That one you can't do fast. <laughs> I think the dream of the of the executive is to stand up there and say, we're all going to go to level two, and here's the chart, and uh, <clears throat> I want you all to get there. While that same CEO sits down with his team and says, now remember, we're a team, and we're all going to get to level two, but don't forget for a minute that you're all competing for my job. Right then and there, <laughs> he has destroyed the very thing he wants. Yeah, so the not answer, to mention that... the answer is he's got to start level two behavior himself and create an incentive system for every layer in the organization to do that. That's the only way I know how. Well, but but also, Ed, we've talked about sort of the, um, you know, recognizing the kind of middle out success. Yeah, talk also, about that. Those, you know, teams that, uh, and, you know, this was one of the things that Google learned with that Project Aristotle, that, that um, the successful engineering teams were the ones that, that sort of operated around this core of psychological safety. And um, it wasn't something in their systems or something in, you know, the way they manage their workflows or project management or something. It was just that it was the, the way that people treated each other in some of the more successful teams. And the point in bringing that up is that there's still that idea that, you know, culture change comes about with, um, you know, in the definition around um, learning shared within a group in the face of you know external challenge and internal integration or, or adaptation and so you know big companies can learn from the successes of small groups within them but if 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 that's not reinforced at the board and the and the c level it, it, it they're going to be you know successful teams that end up getting frustrated and all the you know the 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 sort of proponents of that way of working <laughs> end up leaving and going to places that 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 view of the world or how to you know get stuff done is more welcomed. So it's it's both ways. It's it it I can happen right. middle out, but it has to be reinforced at the top. Well, and you you emphasize the middle out in the corporate culture survival guide as far as that especially in the future, that being likely more important than the, the top down. <laughs> Since you're giving me this opening to, to get to the corporate culture survival guide, I want to ask about the beach. So I'm going to show your new uh, visual analogy for culture here. Just one second. And Peter, you want to take this one? Yes. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I just want to note that 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 illustration there's a copyright ernesto renda that's um one of ed's grandchildren my nephew 
So <laughs> uh, we we had this image in our head and wanted and he's a he's a he's an artist. He's a he's a professional artist. Went to RISD and so we had a we had a inside track on somebody who could help us illustrate something that we had been thinking about. Um, but the idea of this is and 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 I, I, I will confess that in the corporate culture survival guide third edition we wanted to call the book culture change leadership but since the publisher had already published the corporate culture survival guide whose title by the way is you know straight out of the 70s uh, <laughs> we wanted to sort of modernize it with with what we were really talking about which is this idea of the um integral and inseparable relationship between culture change and leadership and um we also wanted to sort of borrow on um a, a famous uh, social anthropologist marshall Sollins, who wrote in the 80s about the sort of continuous and reciprocal process of the structure of culture and the practice of culture evolving together and you know um the the you know that that reciprocal relationship between um practice and structure uh and and ultimately how does that inform how we think about change and so the point of the beach picture is to have a sort of a it, it's it's a generative metaphor in ed's terms it's it's not something that you can test scientifically but you kind of know this is what's going on so if you think of the wave as leadership that it's a new initiative or it's a new leader and that creates um and 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 it's driven by something that's changing right in the in the outside world or the board decides to put a C new ceo in or you're launching a new product so and it's and it's propelled by a specific tailwind again that might be a product issue or a strategy issue or a governance issue or a scandal um anyway your 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 leadership um creates a wave of change that washes over your organization it impacts some people more than others just like a waves kind of apex is gonna is gonna affect different parts of the shore in a different way and so that that initial wave um kind of washes over the 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 beach as it were and creates change right it if you ever stood in the sand and felt how the contour of the beach is changing as that wave washes across but then you realize that um there there's there's a backwash right the 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 process of 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 change is it kind of comes in waves and wherever there's a wave there's a backwash it's it's part of that reciprocal process and so the idea there is to think of that as the way that that culture changes not as some linear process now it it, it at a micro level the linear process processes create change but the question is do, do you always go from point a to point b in the same sort of linear process our argument is no that's not really how it works that it is much more continuous and reciprocal and to re to measure change over time what you're kind of looking at is you're 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 noticing how the contours of the beach have changed with all of those successive and um continuous leadership waves um so again it was the the idea of this model and tim you can just sort of you can push through the 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 illustration okay um uh the the, the idea was to we, we in describing this we tried to compare it in one of the cases that we talk to talk about to the cotter model which which is a very accurate model um for specific initiatives but does it really work at an overall organizational level or do we need to also think about these forces of you know tailwind creating initiatives headwinds representing you know human beings 
natural resistance to change, right? Change is hard. And, and the resettling process in that continuous leadership initiatives as waves and backwashes the sort of the resettling of the sand, how that accumulates over time is how to think about culture change um, again as that wave-like oscillation, um, not as some sort of static and linear process. Great, thanks, Peter. Ed, anything you want to add on that? I think it's a wonderful model because it's a dynamic. All all the other models. <clears throat> have tended to be static like icebergs and ponds and things. And we know that in reality, <clears throat> there is constant leadership or at least tides. Even the tides influence the, the beach. There is constant change. And the, <clears throat> the, the behavioral wing of the culture folks will tell you that the daily behavior both recreates culture and at the same time in minuscule ways changes it. So once we accept culture as a very dynamic process, this model not only helps us to understand it, but it also allows us to take it to something that I think of as, as even more important, namely, <clears throat> occupations as cultures. You can think of the beach as being the culture of management that is beset by all kinds of new models and by leadership initiatives that tell their managers how to do things. But my feeling is that what slows modern development most is that the culture of management is, is very, very dug in. It's got all kinds of peers and backwaters and uh, sorts of ways of not changing. Managers still want to be the tellers, the organizers, the incentivizers, the motivators. And all of that has now shifted in reality to the group and to subordinates and whatnot. And yet we see managers trying to look for a better theory of motivation. How, how can I get my employees to be engaged? And the minute they say, get my employees to be engaged, they've already blown it because they think it's just something they can do. And it doesn't occur to them to examine what does a manager actually do. It's much more a coordination job these days than to get people to do things. Uh, and if you think in terms of collaboration and coordination, then the constructive activity is to start by jointly analyzing what are we trying to do and the manager playing the convener coordinator role rather than the boss role. So I want to rant more and more, and we have to change the culture of management if any of this is going to work, because it's still so deeply dug in. That even is in the business schools. It's equally dug in there. Oh, wow. I think that just just quickly, Tim. One of our beliefs is that managers are going to enjoy this this way of managing more than command and control, right. anyway. That's right. right. How have we have, have we ever had an experience in charge of people when um, we got satisfaction out of of just telling them what to do, rather than arriving at some shared insight and agreeing together what to do? Isn't the latter more satisfying ultimately than just command and control? I, I think so. And, and deep down, I think it's, it's the same point about the constructive cultures idea that those cultures are happier. <laughs> They're happier and more effective. So uh, this time has flown.
Uh, and we're kind of towards the end. We want some final words, and then we're going to have a special opportunity poll for all the attendees. So, Peter, you want to uh, close us out with some final words, and then we'll shift it to Ed? Yeah, sure. I, um, just um, one uh, ridiculous and one sublime. The ridiculous is that people are curious about where to find us, ocli.org is our website and you can contact us through that um i think the last thing that that the that's motivating me these days um is around this idea that there's really something in the air uh, this was in a frederick la Lou book from a few years ago that um we're not alone talking about this we're not unique talking about this we're not necessarily tip of the spear talking about this there's lots of people that, that are coming at this from different angles because there we really think there, there's sort of a zeitgeist here that that um, engagement at work um, and and you know motivating millennials and, and Gen Zers at work is a different game than it was 30 years ago. And right. um, uh, so so again it's 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 being mindful of of ultimately this sort of distinction between transactional and personal that if we just ask ourselves every day you know are we getting toward personal and away from transactional that's gonna that's gonna make a huge difference and it also it requires that we sort of recast how we think of our organization you know we're, it's not a well-oiled machine anymore that's sure but that worked in the 20th century that's not going to work forever in the 21st century um i have a, a sort of a favorite quote right now of um from a obscure t.s Eliot play from 1934 we described kind of humans grappling with challenges and dreaming of systems so perfect that no one will need to be good people still need to be good at work you see they need to be good to each other and they need to to be driven by a purpose that's positive even if the system pretends to be perfect um humans still need to be good at work that's a great quote and uh ed final words from you uh final word is a <clears throat> final question i think at the organizational and work level we've agreed that you need better and open communication and you need collaboration. The question is whether we can even surmount our international competition because we have to in the face of global warming. That this is not just a level a problem at the organization, it's an international level for humanity. Can we get to level two relations among countries and among larger units to develop ways of saving the planet and thereby saving ourselves. That's a great closing, Ed. And uh, thank you both for, for your time today. Uh, we're gonna transition to a, a poll and opportunity for everybody. I'll, uh, share my screen now on that and then uh, Kalani will be setting up the poll. We've got a few options for you and, and all the attendees are going to get information on OCLI.org and the Shine's latest books. Um, we're going to shift to a poll here where if you are interested in piloting the organizational culture inventory, the OCI that uh, Ed and Peter had mentioned with a group of up to 10 people to just uh, see where your subculture is at, or the lifestyles inventory and individual assessment uh, with an individual at no charge you can respond uh, to option a if you're interested in having a call with the human synergistics culture leadership expert you can pick option b and then we've got uh, the other options and again everyone's going to in get information on the shine's latest books so kalani can you start that poll And we'll leave this open for just a minute or two. While we're closing this out, uh, Ed and Peter, what are you doing next? 
what are you writing next? You've uh, gone through a series of books so fast, it's amazing. Uh, so what are you working on now? Well, I mean, one answer is we've been busy uh, doing things like this, talking to people about um, Humble Inquiry and how it sort of has brought together a few through lines from the other books. So uh, <laughs> we've been doing a lot of that, but also thinking a little bit about um, um, what's another way that we can describe describe some some dimensions of culture. Um, uh, it's it's uh, the the tease there is we're we're talking about an idea of called metaculture and and we'll we'll see where that takes us and uh, then the other thing is that um, this uh, this isn't just something you say you're going to do if you believe in this idea of these ideas of um, of humble inquiry and humble consulting um, you have to practice it and in the in the end of the new inquiry, the new humble inquiry edition, we put some mini case studies as ways that people can dive right in to practicing some of the techniques that we are referring to in the book. And we recognize that that's actually might be the best place to start in reading a book like Humble Inquiry, is just diving in and and immersing yourself in some of these simple exercises. So we think that that's true of a lot of the themes that have come out of some of the Humble Leadership series of books. So we may be putting together something like that, uh, a, a set of exercises that people can just dive in with. Awesome. Well, Ed and Peter, thanks again so much for your time with us today. Really appreciate the work you do, sharing all of your, your insights and thinking with so many people. Uh, you do have an incredible impact out there in the world of culture and leadership so thanks again for all you do and for being with us today thanks for all the uh, attendees sticking with us we had a uh, about 315 320 so a really great crowd and uh, thanks again everybody yeah thank thank you for listening all we much it's appreciate a pleasure. it it's been great fun to talk <clears throat> all right Bye -bye. thanks everybody <laughs>